It's the biggest topic in biology at the moment. There is no bigger story. It's moving incredibly fast and it is genuinely revolutionising what we can do as biologists. Hey guys, I'm Eric Olson and welcome to the 10th episode of the Science Centric Podcast. Since our launch in October, we've heard from scientists, journalists, and book authors and had some really great conversations. For those of you that have liked, shared, subscribed, or donated, thank you so much. Your support really means a lot and will help ensure that we can have more great conversations in the future. In this episode, we're talking about the most exciting thing to happen in biology in the last 10 years. The development of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system, more commonly known as CRISPR. Later on, we'll get into how it works, but for now, all you need to know is it's a tool that allows scientists to make precise changes to DNA, even within living cells. And in the near future, it's going to have an impact on pretty much everything, from medicine to conservation to the food we eat. Our guest for this episode, Nessa Carey, knows the story of CRISPR well. Nessa is a molecular biologist who worked in the biotech industry for about 13 years. Her new book, Hacking the Code of Life, How Gene Editing Will Rewrite Our Futures, examines the origin of CRISPR and gives us a glimpse of what we can expect from the technology in the future. While it's mostly positive, there are some areas of concern, particularly in regards to editing the human genome. But before we dive into it, I just wanted to mention that you can win a free copy of Hacking the Code of Life. Just head over to sciencecentric.com giveaway for more details. I will formally uh, welcome you to the Science Centric podcast. Nessa, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so um, I, I like to ask book authors, uh, usually the first question that I ask is, what inspired you to write this book. Your book is called uh, Hacking the Code of Life, How Gene Editing Will Rewrite Our Futures. Um, and, you know, books take a lot of time. There are a lot of effort. So what inspired you to write this book? Uh, I like the my, my books are always about genetics in some form or another. And I like the kind of weirder aspects of genetics, the unexpected stuff. So gene editing allows you to interrogate a lot of the weirder aspects of genetics. But the, the reason I really wanted to write it is basically it's the biggest topic in biology at the moment. There is no bigger story. Uh, it's moving incredibly fast and it is genuinely revolutionizing what we can do as biologists. So really, if you're going to write about anything, why not gene editing? There's no bigger story. <laughs> well, I would agree with you. My, my background is in genetics um, and molecular biology, and I think it's just fascinating. Yeah. I also think, though, that people aren't necessarily aware of what's going on uh, in the general public. I think they get little glimpses of it through news stories. Um, but there isn't like uh, the thing that I like about your book is that you it's it's this overview of kind of everything that's happening. But but why do you think that people don't know what's going on and, and uh, you know, people that aren't super science literate? I think because often these stories come out in bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> they may catch a strange bit of one story and not another. Um, and often a lot of science reporting is about one big paper or one quirky finding. And so people don't necessarily get the opportunity to sit back and put it in a bigger context. Um, and so also I think it's an area where if you're not careful, it's very easy just to concentrate on jargon and concentrate on the technology. I mean, you know what it's like, we're biologists. We like the toys, we like the running the geeky experiments. But actually, if you're a member of the general public, you don't necessarily care about the fine details of the experiments, but what you really need to care about is what those experiments might do or where they could take us. Because scientists, we like our toys, but we need the general population to understand where we're heading and also to build a consensus about whether or not it's comfortable with us heading in that direction. So I think it's hard if you're not immersed in a field to get an overview of why something is important. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I guess for people that are watching or listening to this podcast that aren't super science literate, um, maybe you could just 
tell us how gene editing has changed in the last 10 years um, and, and why is this so revolutionary? What, what, uh, I mean, we've had ways of manipulating DNA for a long time. Uh, obviously, like g- genetically modified foods have been in the news a lot, but, but what's, what's really changed? So genetic modification, the original technology is developed about 50 years ago. And for a long time, they didn't change substantially. And they allowed us to change DNA, but they were quite difficult technologies to use. So you could only use them in a very restricted range of species. And they actually were really only very good for introducing really big changes into the genome. If you just wanted to make one really subtle change, it was very difficult. The new technology, which is gene editing, which I call hacking, um, which is also called CRISPR, what that does is it allows you to make exquisitely sensitive changes to DNA. So, for example, there's three billion letters, essentially, in our DNA alphabet. And with the very best form of gene editing, you can change just one of them and leave everything else unchanged. Um, And that's happened in the last seven years. And the other great thing about it is not only is it exquisitely sensitive and controllable, it's really easy to use. So the new technology, it's a bit like comparing the way we all cut and paste and edit documents in word processing programs. It's a bit like being able to do that rather than thinking back to when people used to have to use movable type and move bits of metal around to try and create the right printout of something. It's that big a jump in how easy it is to do genetic changes in the genome um, of any species that you like, actually. Mm -hmm. That's one of the other things that's revolutionary about it. You can just take your favorite species and you can start changing its genome. It's amazing. Yeah, and and I think, um, if I understand correctly, I mean, some of the other issues with previous technology were that you couldn't, um, you couldn't, make necessarily one change that maybe changes would happen in multiple spots at one time you couldn't zero in yeah. on a specific location is that is that your understanding yeah you you could target the old technologies to a specific location sometimes but yeah. you always left other changes in there as well so it was like um leaving signals in there so putting in extra bits of different genes from different species just to try to get in the one bit that you wanted ah. so, with the new technologies, with gene editing, it's a single hit. You put the reagents into the cell, the DNA is changed, and that's it. You would never know it had been changed. There's no other extra bits left in. Yeah. It's an incredibly clean system. So the so the system we're talking about is the CRISPR-Cas9 system? Yeah, that's and right. I think one thing that you really did well in the book is that you didn't focus too much on the technical details of how that works. I mean, you, you do have a section talking about the history of how that was developed, but it, um, it's, um, it is, it is very, you know, technical in terms of the molecular biology. Um, but, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about how that, how that developed rather than, you know, the specific mechanism um, to be able to to zero in on that that one little section of DNA and edit it. Yeah, like so much really amazing science, this all developed originally by accident. Um, a scientist who was simply interested in genes in bacteria realized bacteria had these really strange repeating sequences with other non-repeating bits in between the repeats. And those are called, and, those are called gene cassettes, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd get, if you think of it like, say, um, a sequence of Lego bricks, there'd be a red Lego brick, then you might have a yellow one, then there'd be another or- red one, then there'd be a blue one, and then another red one. So the red ones stay the same, but the colors in between them can change. Uh-huh. And when he found these sequences in bacteria, it took him a while to work out what they were. And eventually he realized they were a defense mechanism against viruses because bacteria can be attacked by viruses. Uh-huh. And he realized that the red Lego brick regions, if we can call them that, those had to stay the same, but that the bacteria could put any other bits in between those red ones. So they could put in sequences that were specific to certain viruses, and that would allow them to break down the virus when it came into the cell. And the next really big step was that scientists who were interested in trying to change the DNA of other organisms 
they decided to investigate if you could take the equivalent of those red Lego bricks out of bacteria, put them basically into a test tube with whatever color Lego brick you wanted in between. So a sequence that corresponded to any gene you were interested in. And they found that it worked. It was amazing. It allows you, um, as long as you had a particular protein that acts like a pair of scissors and chops up the matching DNA, then you can basically target any gene in any organism. It was absolutely remarkable, but it all just started from curiosity. Uh Somebody was wondering what these weird little sequences did. (laughs) Excellent. So when we're talking about we're talking about CRISPR Cas9, which yeah. w- which which part is the Lego bricks and which part is the scissors? So CRISPR is the Lego bricks, so uh-huh. it's a sequence of DNA. Uh-huh. And, um, Cas9 is the protein; it's the scissors that cut up. So basically, if the coloured yellow coloured Lego brick, the one in between the two red bits finds a sequence in the DNA of the organism you've introduced it to that it can bind to. So imagine a yellow Lego brick binding to another yellow Lego brick. That binds and the scissors come along and they recognize that the two red Lego bricks are stuck in the DNA somewhere and they Uh just cut it. Uh The original form of CRISPR-Cas9, it cut the DNA and our cells would then desperately try to repair the DNA and they'd do it very badly and you'd end up stopping that gene from working. It would just be a mess. It would be knocked out. But so many people have now worked on CRISPR that you can go all the way from, yeah, we can just knock out a gene, we can stop it functioning, to we can just change one base pair, one letter yeah. in the DNA alphabet. So you can use it in lots of different ways to manipulate the genome, but it all relies on the same basic technology of this DNA sequence and the scissors. Yeah, so it's it's either you can just take a sequence and just snip it out and then it the DNA sort of gets knitted back together, yep. or you yep. can say, I'm gonna put some other change or piece of DNA yep. in there and then that will get incorporated into the genome. You can put in a whole new piece of DNA if you want to, or you can just correct a single mutation if you needed to. Yeah. Um, And it just allows a whole range of things to be done that we could never do do before. So we can explore the action of single genes and particular variants of single genes. But it also means, in theory, we should be able to reverse diseases which are caused by very subtle changes in DNA. So it's a hugely wide ranging technology. Hey, I just wanted to take a quick pause to thank HostGator, this episode's sponsor. HostGator is one of the world's top 10 largest web hosting companies with over 8 million hosted domains. They have around-the-clock support, and all shared web hosting plans include a 45-day money-back guarantee. I've personally used HostGator since 2008 for all of my web hosting needs, and I really couldn't be happier. Sign up today using the promo code SCIENCE, and you'll receive 25% off any new hosting plan. Now on with the show. So that's a good segue to talk about uh, some of the some of the positive <laughs> things that we yeah. can do with this, um, and and maybe you could just um, you know rather than saying all of them, you could just maybe just mention a few that you're personally excited about or you, that you think would have yeah. like a profound effect. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is you can use this to create much better variety of crops and foods that we all rely on. And we desperately need to do this. We need to be able to grow crops more efficiently and we need them to use up less of the Earth's resources while we do it. Because your agriculture contributes to climate change. It's also contributing to probably the loss of a million species over the next 50 years. If And it's already been shown that you can use gene editing to create, for example, rice crops that will grow in quite salty water. Um, And salt is a real problem in agriculture. We've salinated lots of the land. So we should, if we use this technology wisely, be able to create crops that don't need us to put so much energy into them and that can grow more efficiently so that we use up less land and are more nutritious because many people in the world, hundreds of millions, if not a billion people, rely on crops that really haven't changed much because the people who rely on them are very poor and there's been no financial incentive for plant breeders to do all the really long time consuming work to create better varieties of those crops. You can short circuit all of that now. 
you could just use gene editing to create better versions of those crops. So it could open up much better nutrition for people who desperately need it. So you've got the food side at one end, which I think is really cool and really impressive. And then there's this possibility of developing much better cures for conditions that we really can't cure at the moment. So things like sickle cell disease. Yeah, we actually have the option that somebody, instead of having to be on drugs all of their lives, could have gene editing of their bone marrow cells and start producing healthy red blood cells and be fine for the rest of their lives, which is yeah. pretty amazing. That would be extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And and that's probably the, the, the place we'll see it first, right, in terms of fixing these genetic diseases that have a very clear, um, yeah. clear, you know, change that we can see and then can go in and just change that rather than some of these more chronic illnesses like heart disease or diabetes yeah. or something like that. Absolutely, because things like heart disease and diabetes, we really don't know which genes we would want to change because those are influenced by lots of changes um, in our DNA. But something like sickle cell disease, yeah. you, for an individual patient, you know exactly why they have sickle cell disease and you know exactly what to do to stop them having sickle cell disease. Yeah. And in fact, there are clinical trials already starting with gene editing to treat sickle cell disease, which is incredible because it was only shown to work outside of bacteria seven years ago. And already there are companies in the clinic trying to make you know, this absolute cure for patients with this condition. So it, it's kind of mind blowing how quickly it's happened. Yeah. And is that now for for that particular illness, would is that just something that people would consume? They would consume the this, no. this, or how um, does that work? How do, how do you introduce this gene editing into somebody that, like an adult or, or, or even yeah. a child? Yeah. Uh, the reasons, one of the reasons why sickle cell disease is such a good one to work on and will almost certainly be the first clinical use of this technology is because with sickle cell disease, what you have is you have problems with the red blood cells and they're carrying a mutation. Red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow from um, what we would call stem cells. What you can do is you can take out some of the bone marrow from a patient. You can grow the stem cells in culture, in a dish, in a lab. You can treat them with the gene editing reagents. You can make sure everything's fine with the cells, that the gene editing change has happened and nothing else has happened. And if you then inject them back into the patient's bloodstream, they will go back to the bone marrow and they will populate the bone marrow and they will create healthy red blood cells. So it's great because all of the bits that you need to control and you need to run the tests on will all happen outside the patient. Mm. So it's a really clever use of the technology. You never actually put the gene editing reagents directly into the person. Right. So it's a really smart one. So you're really just going in and fixing those progenitor cells, the cells yeah. that give birth to other cells. Absolutely. And then they, they, they populate the, the, the yeah. system, the person's body. Yeah. Yeah, which is really clever because once the gene editing is done, it's there forever. And those cells will keep dividing, keep producing new healthy red blood cells. It's a really um, attractive way of treating this condition. And it would be amazing for patients with sickle cell not to have to be on drugs all their life, especially because the drugs don't work very well. Right, right. And is that, and I mean, they presumably would still have some of the cells that are producing bad red blood cells. So then what happens there? Is it just kind of, there's enough of them that it, that it counteracts the problem? Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh -huh. And that's what the um, first clinical trials will be looking at. They won't be trying to cure the disease straight away. They'll be looking to see things like how many of these progenitor cells do you have to change and get mm -hmm. back into the body in order for them to overcome the symptoms. So that's exactly what the case is. It wouldn't ma it won't matter too much that there are some of the original mutated ones there as long as you have enough of the corrected ones. Right. That would reverse the phen the disease. So right. it's pretty cool. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and there's a there's a I mean there's a huge range of of diseases like this that are usually terrible um you know, terrible consequence. I mean <clears throat> Werner syndrome is one that people may know which is yeah um I think <coughs> people with Werner syndrome die an early death um there, there are a lot of genetic diseases yeah. uh, and the health burden for the individuals is really tough yeah some of them will be much easier to treat than others um so something like sickle cell disease any of the blood disorders yeah. will be much easier to treat than say something that predominantly affects the brain 
because you'd have to get the gene editing reagents into the brain and that's actually quite hard to do um so i think we'll see it with things like the blood disorders first those will be the easiest ones to treat and then probably it will be anything that's in the liver because it's really easy to get drugs and reagents to the liver so yeah it's it's going to be not all not all diseases will be as easy to treat as others but in theory they would all be treatable right right great so we talked about some of the really positive uh, yeah. impacts that this technology will have. But are there also negative impacts? I know people, for example, have a lot of concerns about genetically modified foods. Um, yeah. People may have concerns about, you know, modifying animals and then having them released into the wild. That could be another, you know, source of concern. Um, you know, if, if we start making changes in uh, humans, would this quickly spin out of control and, and would we turn into some kind of weird hybrid <laughs> species yeah, sure. that, that isn't even human anymore? I think people have concerns. So so yeah. what, are, what are your thoughts on that? It's fair enough that people have concerns. Um, you know, as a scientific community, we haven't always done the best job of communicating the limitations of technology. Um, there's no such thing as a good or bad technology. All there are are technologies that we use well or we use badly. So if we take the example of editing foodstuffs, so creating better crops, one thing that's important to remember is we've done that for thousands of years. It was just we did it by selecting and breeding only the varieties we wanted. So if you look at any of the crops that we rely on in the West, they look nothing like the original plants that we got them from. So we've done it for a very long time. All we're doing now is changing the way that we do that. We're doing it very directly, very quickly. Um, I gave you the example of rice that can grow in salty conditions and was saying that that could be great because we could start, instead of constantly using new land, we could keep using the old land and we could use smaller areas of land. So in theory, that should work really well. We'll start using less land to grow more crops. But the flip side to that is, imagine if you're a rice farmer in a poor area and you've suddenly got access to this wonderful new rice. If your family's well-being depends on your income, the temptation to think, oh, now I've got this fabulous new rice, I could grow it not just in my existing paddy fields, but I could start growing it in those bits where it never used to grow well before. You would start expanding the acreage and you'd start planting in all those marginal areas, which in many places are the only parts of the world where biodiversity is hanging on. So even with something as good as changing crops, we have to be very careful. If it means we just start destroying more and more of the natural world, because now we have plants that can tolerate wider range of conditions, I think that would be a very unfortunate development. Yeah, for sure. Um, with humans, people worry very much about the creating superhumans, you know, people who are smarter, faster, brighter, etc. <laughs> That's extremely unlikely to happen with gene editing, um, mainly because all of those things that we say we're worried about, like intelligence and height and good looks and all that sort of thing, we have no idea how to control those right. through gene editing. Um, they're a combination of hundreds of genes working together and interacting with the environment. It's not like we could go in and change things. Um, the other area where people worry is about passing on gene edited changes to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So with something like the sickle cell disease treatment, that won't happen. When that patient finally dies, just like the rest of us, their blood cells will decompose and that's an end of it. But we can use this technology to edit the DNA of embryos who we know would be carrying lethal genetic diseases. If we do that and those embryos develop into individuals, they will pass on that change to their offspring. Now, some people are very worried about this, but on the other hand, you have people who have these genetic disorders saying, what's the big deal? If you do that, all you are doing is changing the abnormal DNA in one person to the same DNA sequence as is found in the other 7 billion people on the planet. So mm -hmm. why, why are you so worried about it? Yeah. So it's all about how we apply the technology, but there's no such thing as good or bad technology, really. Everything's, yeah. it's all about us as humans and how we use it, which is kind of sad because usually we're a bit dumb about this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Well, we'll and I, I think too for, for parents that 
perhaps are carriers of, of certain genetic illnesses, this would be a huge relief that you could you could eliminate this risk of having a, a child that, that would have a genetic mutation. Absolutely. Um, and although there are ways of doing that at the moment by screening embryos so that you, for example, would terminate if a child, if an embryo had the mutation or you wouldn't implant it if you were using in vitro fertilization, test tube baby technology, not everybody is comfortable with doing that. And sometimes also, particularly if you're using test tube technology, you just don't have enough embryos that you can screen and select the ones that are going to be healthy. It's quite feasible that all the embryos would be carrying the mutation. Yeah. And parents, understandably, don't want to have a child who they know is going to suffer terribly. It's not really that they want a perfect child. It's that they don't want a child who's, for example, going to live in terrible pain for most of their lives. And I think everybody can understand that. Yeah, for certain. Yeah, and I think I I think that we're at a point where we we can screen for these things but we don't necessarily have a way to to fix them you know like we have this ability now we have all this uh, information about dn you know people's dna but we don't we can't fix really fix anything screening is one way but we can't no edit. This is, and and so this is this is amazing you know yeah this is the first time we've been able to fix it otherwise it was just a case of just not implanting those embryos or terminating pregnancies um we've never had the chance actually to fix it before yeah. and so this is a real game changer and we do need as societies to decide how we feel about this ethically but it's incredibly important that when we do that that discussion is not just left to the scientists right um, and it's also really important that it's not just left, say, to religious groups or ethics professionals. We have to get people like um, families who are carrying these diseases engaged because they're the ones who understand the reality of what it is living with these conditions. Right. So right. You know, we, we need to involve multiple sectors of society in this discussion. But because this technology is so good and because it's so easy to use, it kind of has changed the ethical question. So the ethical question in the past would have been, is it right to in, to interfere in these diseases with technologies that would have been potentially risky? Now I think it's flipped the ethical question. The technology is so good, we have to ask, would it be ethical to withhold this technology from affected families? And that's a very big switch in an ethical position, which is purely driven by the fact this technology is so good. Yeah. Yeah, that's I. That's a really interesting point. Um, yeah, and I think as as a parent, you would you would really have to think that through. <laughs> Let's put it yeah. that way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do I do I get do I take the gamble and I risk having yes. a child that has this yeah. um, this you know potential of having this genetic disease, or do I you know use this technology and and eliminate that and. And you're I, I think I think the answer is actually kind of obvious there, but um, I think so too. Because what are you yeah. going to do, parent? Say 15 years later, when a child who's suffering appallingly says, "You're kidding, right? You had the chance for me not to go through all this pain, and you yeah. decided not to." And it, it raises really interesting questions as well about why do we feel so intensely personal about our DNA sequence? when most of us probably have no clue what our DNA sequence actually is. <laughs> and yet somehow it seems to trigger this really fundamental response. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, maybe there's some deep-seated evolutionary uh, <laughs> reason yeah, we're concerned yeah, about maybe. it. Maybe. <laughs> it's, it's a very odd one. It's really it's, strange. It's a, it's a glitch in the program. <laughs> yeah, I think you might be right. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, what happened late last year. Oh, yeah. Um, there, there was big news out of China. I actually did a video about this on my channel. Uh, people can go huh? back and, and, and take a look at it. Um, but uh, a Chinese scientist came out uh, and said that he had actually done this, that he had edited the, yeah. the uh, DNA of embryos to, I believe, make them resistant to HIV um, because their parents were infected or one of their parents was infected. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, um, so the father was infected. The father was HIV positive, And yeah. that carries a big stigma in China. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what that scientist had done was um, 
to edit the DNA of a receptor that's required as a molecule on the surface of cells that HIV needs to get inside cells. It's not the classic one that we think about. It's not CD4, which is most people know that's how HIV enters cells. Mm -hmm. But in order to do so, there's another surface molecule that HIV needs to operate on as well called CCR5. And the Chinese scientists mutated CCR5 so that HIV would not be able to get into the cells. And he said he did this to protect the girls from becoming HIV positive and the stigma of being HIV positive. The problem is it's really easy to prevent transmission from father to children. Right. Yeah, I was very uh, actually I was actually confused about that because I was yeah. like how would they have gotten HIV from him? I don't exactly. really understand that. But they wouldn't. Yeah. Basically. Um, you know, it just needs very simple precautions around body fluids. So the chances of a child being infected because their father is positive rather than their mother, very, very low. So there wasn't really a strong clinical justification for doing this. And then it turns out that it's not at all clear if the ethical approval really if anyone particularly understood what they were approving at the time. Um, and also from the little that we know, because he presented these results at a conference, it doesn't look like the editing was done very well. So there may have been off target effects. And the other problem is that the CCR5 molecule, the one that he mutated, is required to give people resistance to things like West Nile fever virus. Uh -huh. But also, if you have mutations in CCR5, you can be much more severely affected by influenza. And we pretty much are all certain that the next influenza pandemic will start in China or another part of the East. Right. So really not one to be mucking about with. <laughs> um, and so that that was a bit disastrous. And now... A sci and two girls were born who were edited. They were twin sisters. And now a scientist in Russia is saying he's going to do the same thing, um, basically, um, in embryos where the mother is HIV positive. And he's used this fantastic expression of saying, I think I'm crazy enough to do it. And as soon as someone says something like that, you just think, OK, you're crazy enough that you shouldn't be allowed access to any of it. You know, you are clearly not a man who is thinking, oh, I'll take a measured approach to the ethics of this situation. <laughs> So it's uh, um, so that's it, really because oh it started this backlash about yeah. whether it will ever be appropriate to do this. You know, everybody was trying to create a kind of global consensus, trying to make sure there was really good public engagement, trying to make sure we would move this slowly and appropriately. And then this just came barreling in out of left field. And um, yeah, it's not been helpful, not at all. <laughs> so I think this raises a really interesting question though, which is, um, you know, because this technology is out there, because it's so accessible, because it's, relatively easy to use for anybody that you know has a basic knowledge of molecular biology and cell culture and those sorts of things i mean can we really put the genie back in the bottle i mean yeah. and, and and if not then then is there any way to to regulate this or to um you know we don't have a world government. I mean, how can we regulate this and 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 make sure that things like what what happened in China aren't happening uh, in other little corners of the world? Yeah. Um, so this technology, we've never really had an example before where you have a technology that's so powerful and so easy to use. You know, this is not like nuclear technology. You can pretty much tell if a rogue state is trying to build nuclear weapons. Um, that's not something you can do quietly. Right. on a small scale. This isn't like that. And so it's going to be incredibly difficult to prevent anyone who wants to do something naughty from doing it. Um, within all the established democracies or established societies where there's strong regulation, those countries will be able to regulate how this is used. And it still won't stop people doing the wrong thing any more than you can stop a criminal doing anything. You know, it's, but it's about having the right processes in place so that most people who are going to use it, use it responsibly. I think one of the biggest problems that we'll see quite early is we'll see um, basically a strange form of tourism developing, health tourism. Mm. So at the moment, for example, you already have situations where really desperate people fly off to parts of the world where 
unscrupulous clinicians and scientists are offering totally unproven therapies like stem cell therapies, um, which don't work and have risks and are basically just profiting from other people's desperation. I think the biggest problem we'll see in terms of health with gene editing initially will be that there will be irresponsible people in poorly regulated parts of the world who start offering mm -hmm. gene editing therapies. And that's potentially one of the most worrying aspects of this. The other worrying aspects is in theory, there's no reason why you couldn't modify, say, bacteria to become much more pathogenic. Um, or to be even more resistant to, bacteria, uh, to antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to require consensus. So many countries, I think, will eventually bring in laws that outlaw just certain really extreme uses of the technology. But it will be very difficult to prevent anyone doing it. What it will be allow you to do is then to prosecute somebody. But it's going to be a problem. So we talked about the human aspect of this, about you know making these these permanent changes to the DNA of humans as a species. But what about other species uh, that, that would be living in the wild and could potentially have an impact on other uh, native species living in, a wild? Is, in the wild? Is that um, a concern that people have or is it a legitimate concern? I guess is, is a better question. Um, it's a concern. It's this is about combining the technology of gene editing with a technology called gene drive, which means you could basically make a toxic version of the gene and have it spread through an animal population really quickly to wipe out that population. Now, there are situations where that could be hugely beneficial because one of the things that humans have done is we've moved animals all over the place where we shouldn't have done. So if you look at a place called Gough Island, which is one of the most important seabird nesting areas in the world, um, the birds at the moment, the chicks are being eaten alive by great big fat mice, which are the descendants of mice we accidentally released on Gough Island. Now, you could combine gene editing and gene drive to try and wipe out those mouse populations. And that would be awesome because the mice shouldn't be there. And it would create safety again for these really endangered seabirds. But people are also talking about using gene editing and gene drive in native species, so species like mosquitoes. And of course, the reason why it's being put forward is that mosquitoes can transmit quite a lot of harmful organisms to humans. So malaria is the most obvious one. So there's talk of using this combination of gene drive and gene editing in mosquito populations to make the mosquito population collapse and to prevent the transmission of malaria. I think that's a much more contentious use of the technology because we really don't know what would happen to the rest of the ecosystem if we wipe out the mosquitoes. It could have huge knock-on effects on the entire ecosystem. Traditionally, we've been very, very unsuccessful when we've interfered at an ecosystem level with organisms, it, it really doesn't go very well. No. Um, and so we have no clue what would happen to the ecosystems there. Um, of course, I live in England where there are no mosquitoes that transmit disease. So it's really easy for me to say, I'm worried about the ecosystem. But if I were a mother, say in West Africa and my children were suffering horrifically badly with malaria, I might have a different view on it. Yeah. So again, it's gonna be one where we really need to build up a strong ethical consensus of all groups who are involved in this. But yeah, the combination of gene editing and gene drive, that really worries me because that really is like just chucking a bomb out into the natural world and yeah. just wait what happens after the explosion. Well, I guess I guess in addition, you, you might think of a scenario where people were, you know, trying to make changes to animals that would make them better as food items or something like that. Um, I'm thinking in particular of salmon, which, you know, that's, that comes up a lot now. I mean, there are, I believe yeah. they do have genetically modified salmon, but yeah, yeah, but genetically be, modified salmon already exist. But I guess yeah. because this technology makes things, you know, so much sort of easier, um, you could see more of this happening and, and more of these, these modified yeah. organisms maybe getting out and out competing other species. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's going to have to be dealt with on a case by case basis. So if, for example, you're talking about, I don't know, um, pigs in the UK, well, we don't really have any native pig species in the UK anymore. Yeah. You know, there are some wild boar, but they were reintroduced. So even if the modified pigs got out, they wouldn't be causing any particular damage. Um, but if you're 
if you've got native types of a of a species like say the primitive cows primitive horses etc you really wouldn't want necessarily to have that gene pool contaminated by genes from out competing domestic animals that have been released um the same as say wolves and domestic dogs and wild cats and domestic cats right it's already a problem anyway having right. competition right. domestic <laughs> wild species and really just giving the domestic species even more of a leg up by making them genetically superior that, that doesn't sound like the best idea to me. no not at all um yeah, I think I think that makes sense, and and yeah, it's not a it's not a problem that's specific to this gene editing. I think it's just that this new technology of CRISPR Cas nine, but it's just it's just that you could see it being used more frequently and. Uh, oh yeah, much more frequently. I mean, yeah. that, that really is the issue: is that you don't have to be that good technically to get gene editing to work. I I always say if you have access to a basic laboratory and enough brain cells to do up your own lab coat, you can probably get gene editing to work. Um, and that's both fantastic and really, really scary. Yeah. Well, I'll be, I'll be waiting to see my, my CRISPR Cas9 kit at my uh, local pharmacy. Uh. You know what? It may not be that well, <laughs> Anyways, that's, that's probably a good place to stop. Um, <laughs> Anyways, Nessa, thanks so much for coming on. Um, Eric, really book, enjoyed. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's a great conversation. Um, the the book again is called "Hacking the Code of Life: How Gene Editing Will Rewrite Our Futures." Um, it's uh, it's a great overview of of what's happening in the field. We we you know barely scratch the surface of what's in here, and I think if anybody wants to get a good sense and a good understanding of what's happening in the field of genetics and genetic engineering uh it's a great place to start so uh, thank you very much <laughs> all right so uh we'll sign off there thank you thank you very much eric great talking to you well that's it for this show if you learn something be sure to smash the subscribe button also click that little notification bell to get notified when we upload new episodes also i'd love to hear from you so please leave your comment or question below Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.